A dancing mayor ultimately wasn't enough. Kansas City eliminated this week from their quest to host the Republican National Convention. Plus, it could be the most befuddling issue you'll be asked to decide on any ballot this election year. This half hour, we dissect right to farm on your August ballot in Missouri. Also this week, the city was ordered to put Clay Chastain's light rail plan before voters. So how come nowhere in the ballot language does it mention light rail? And Kansas City marking 100 years of World War I. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes and thanks for being with us again on the program that takes you behind the headlines making news on both sides of our state line, dissecting those stories from Jefferson City. The Star's Missouri State House correspondent Jason Hancock is with us. From 41 Action News, Garrett Hake. From the Kansas City Star Editorial Board, Barbara Shelley. And Star Political Reporter, Blogger and Columnist, Dave Helling. When Mayor Sly James just three weeks ago was seen dancing on the tarmac of the downtown airport with the head of the Republican National Convention Site Selection Committee, it was seen as a powerful symbol of the city's warmth and hospitality. Combined with fireworks at the Kaufman Center, city leaders went all out to impress. But this week, Kansas City's two-year bid for the 2016 GOP convention came to an abrupt end as it was officially eliminated from consideration. RNC leaders narrowing the host cities to just two, Dallas and Cleveland. But did they give an explanation for why Kansas City came up short, Garrett Hake? No, they really didn't. They've basically said, best of luck, try again next time. I mean, we've heard a number of different theories about it, but there's no one simple answer for why we didn't get the job done. We have no understanding of why this didn't happen for Kansas City after all this time. This was a two-year bid, Dave. Right, and I think the problems that we all identified in Kansas City's effort two years ago remained problems to the very end. That is, they lacked, the city lacks, close-in, high-quality hotel rooms. They had enough hotel space for the convention, Nick, but they didn't have the high-quality rooms close to the Sprint Center that I think the Republicans wanted. Uh, transit was a bit of a problem. And then, you know, I wrote this in my story, and we forget this sometimes, the bids from the other cities were pretty good, too. I mean, sometimes you lose because you can't beat what the other cities are offering. Dallas, for example, has raised or, or has told the RNC they have about $45 million in their pocket. Cleveland has new hotel space downtown. So you put all of those factors together, and, uh, and Kansas City came up short. One other quick note, we were always a long shot. People think that somehow we were some favorite or this, this is a big disappointment. This was really a reach for the brass ring uh, and we just came up short. But Jason, um, those other cities didn't have dancing mayors on the tarmac and so on. W were we always a long shot? I, we probably were. I think that it was always going to be sort of a, a difficult ask to bring it to a state that's not only not considered to be a swing state anymore, but is also going to have, like Dave said, a lot of, of, of issues with some of the things that they were looking for, whether that be accommodations, whether that be transit. And even though it sort of brought, even where I was from, legislators together to try to, to put some money into the kitty to try to, to coax these people into Kansas City, it just probably was never going to be enough. So. Did we gain anything in this process, Barbara, even though the big party is not going to be coming here now in 2016? Well, they made the, you know, the Final Four, that's pretty good, and um, you know, got a chance to talk up Kansas City and talk up our assets and things like that. I think there's a bit of a, a psychic plus from the whole thing. But it still cost us a lot of money, Dave. Even yes, though we the didn't the taxpayers get this. kicked in two hundred and sixty thousand dollars from Johnson County, Wyandotte, Jackson, and, and Kansas City, Missouri. Plus, there was a lot of fundraising on the side. The police uh, estimate. Uh, of cost for police protection just for the visit was around forty thousand dollars so there was some cost to all of this that may become more clear in the in the weeks to come um, and but you know the city did learn some lessons about how to attract these types of things it did learn where its shortfalls might be for a major convention like this and it will certainly reignite the conversation about a downtown Garrett. convention hotel well and I think you're right but a downtown convention hotel is would definitely be a big part of this but it may not be enough I mean right. this is probably the last time for a good long while we're gonna have this conversation about a political convention coming to Kansas City in a serious way you had the sort of big 40-year 
year anniversary. You had a clean slate politically. You had a Democratic mayor who was very committed to doing this. And have all those stars align again in the near future seems unlikely. Given all the crowds at the Power and Light District, the mayor is not thinking of pick, taking a bid for the World Cup now, Garen? Uh, okay. Well, we, we have a stadium that won't flood. Okay, we have right. that going. Barbara. I'd just say one other plus, Nick, um, by state cooperation. We don't see that very often, but we saw it here. It's probably the most befuddling item you will be asked to decide on any ballot this election year. Do you believe the Missouri Constitution should be amended to make room for a right to farm if you live in Missouri? It's a question you're going to be asked to decide less than six weeks from now when it appears on your August ballot. Across the nation, we've seen initiative petitions, we've seen ballot amendments, we've seen uh, legislative actions in individual states that would... Uh, prohibit farmers from using technology we know to be safe. Amendment 1 would strengthen legal recourse against legislation and ballot measures that place unreasonable restrictions on farming and ranching. There are activist groups out here today who want to tell you and I what we can eat and how we can eat it. These unintended regulations, um, while people think that they're just protecting cats and dogs, trickle down to the family farm and they limit our ability to give our animals the care that they need. Uh, this won't change a single regulation that's on the books, whether it be at the county level, at the state level, at the federal level. And as uh, new regulations are needed in their future, they'll be able to be passed as well. Uh, this just provides a layer of protection to farmers uh, that we think we need. That's what the proponents are saying, including the Missouri Farm Bureau, who are heavily pushing this and putting lots of money behind this campaign. But what would actually change if you vote yes, Jason Hancock? I've read the summary, I've read the resolution that goes with the summary, I've read it a number of times and honestly I have no idea. And, and I think a lot of people don't. It seems like the only thing everyone seems to be able to agree on is that ultimately it's going to be a judge that decides what this constitutional amendment means. What happens if you vote no then? Because there are opponent groups are saying we do not want to pass this. If you vote no and you, you're saying you don't want to put that in the, in the Constitution, what you're basically saying is that the fear is that when this thing goes to court, when people start using this as a leg to stand on in court, that you could start to see some of these local ordinances, you could start to see state restrictions on animal welfare or in the environment fall by the wayside because now it's about a constitutionally protected thing, farming, as opposed to just you know, the profession of farming. Garrett, it feels like a crowbar to pry open all these different doors to, to file lawsuits. I mean, when I look at this, I don't see something that is especially protective of small family farms or anything like that. I see it as a tool for lobbyists and for organizations who need another legal ground to file lawsuits to fight regulations, trying to put something into the books that then they can go back and, and refight some of these battles. Barbara. Um, supporters of this will tell you it's an outgrowth of the puppy mill vote that we had, which, you know, caused all kinds of fighting and everything. But in fact, Missouri's not the only state that's doing this. Um, there are groups, uh, one of them being the American Legislative Exchange Council, which promotes corporate agendas. There are national groups promoting these kinds of initiatives to basically give a free pass to um, corporate agriculture. I mean, in my opinion, that's a lot of what this is about. Jason. When this started, it was an incredibly much more expansive amendment. It started in the legislative process a couple years ago after the puppy mill, and it sort of got watered down through the process. And if you were in the Senate when it finally passed, and that was sort of the last hurdle, everyone who was opposed to it was pretty satisfied that they had taken this down to, to virtually no impact. But again, it's, it's the same with any law that we pass. It's going to face legal challenges. It's going to end up in a courtroom, and a judge is going to be the one that decides. You know, some people are viewing this as, as about you know rural conservative interests. We talked about corporate interests here. But when I looked at the website as to who is endorsing this, Dave Helling, the top person on that list uh, that they put on there was Representative Emanuel Cleaver, Kansas City Democrat. Well, I, in part because he has some uh, rural areas now in his district that he didn't have before, and I think he wants to prove his bona fides on an issue that I don't think has electrified uh, voters in Kansas or in Missouri uh, going into the primary. I, al I always chuckle when I look at advertisements like that, though, because you know it, it, the, the pictures are all of family farms and and, mm -hmm. and nice sheep and pigs on the farm. <laughs> when in fact this is about, or at least arguably about, factory farming and and hog farming that is in some communities quite. 
aggressive and concerns people. It reminds me a little bit of the campaign around riverboat gaming where the pictures, if you'll recall, were all families walking off the riverboat and the paddle wheel churning down the river. And of course, we all know gambling is not that and was not that really at the time. So voters are going to have to pay a little bit of attention as they go, uh, go to the polls. So Jason, Jason, you've done some reporting on this. So how, how do you advise voters when they go to the uh, polling stations in August when they size up this uh, ballot issue? Well, it's a little surprising to me. You haven't really seen a lot of anti-Amendment 1 uh, advertising out there yet, which is what most people were expecting. The Humane Society was involved. They were going to pour a lot of money into the campaign. We were going to see puppies in cages, and Sarah McLaughlin was going to play. And <laughs> right, it right. was going to be this really heart-wrenching campaign to try to get to, to turn voters against this. We haven't seen that yet, and it doesn't feel like there's going to be much of an opposition campaign, which kind of leads me to think that maybe they're not as worried about it as maybe Because, as you brought up, it has been watered down. Correct. Okay. Right. After a judge last week orders city leaders to put Clay Chastain's light rail plan on the ballot, but gives the council the authority to write the ballot language, council members uh, p p propose a measure that not once mentions light rail. Instead, the November ballot proposal will ask voters to approve two sales taxes. The first, a quarter cent sales tax hike for capital improvements. The second, an eighth of a cent sales tax increase for transportation. By not mentioning light rail, though, won't voters be confused? Doesn't this break with the spirit of the judge's ruling, Barbara? I think it does. Um, and, you know, I just think this is more of this bad blood between city officials and Clay Chastain. And, um, yeah, of course it's going to be confusing to voters to go to the ballot and see, oh, I'm asking for, being asked for a sales tax increase. What's that all about? You know, um, you know and the, the truth is the city council and opponents of this, they can defeat this on its merits. I mean, people know, you know I mean, it's easy to say, to, to, to show to voters that this is, an, an, another unrealistic plan. But doesn't Clay Chastain have the opportunity, though, to appeal the ballot language? I, I'm not sure on the legality, but if anyone, if there's a loophole there, he will. Okay. Uh, this is absolutely an issue that he will fight tooth and nail for. And while this is sort of a legally minimalist approach by the city, it comes off as petty. Mm -hmm. And it, what it does is it doesn't get us any closer to Chastain, even if this does get defeated on its merits, which it very well likely would, sort of saying, feeling like he had his day in court. And he's proven he's got nothing better to do than to continue to fight this any way he can. Were you surprised, though, that the city council took this <laughs> position? No. They no, they've been uh, poking sticks at Clay Chastain for 25 years, and he at them. I mean, okay. they, you know, Barb's right when, he say, when, when she says that there's bad blood between the two. I, I think the bad faith on the part of the city council is particularly egregious in this case because not only can voters vote no, but they can repeal the ordinance if they want to. That's what petition ordinances, so they have the ultimate say anyway. You might as well put it on, let people have their say, make your decision, and try not to make a point every time uh, you have a fight with Clay Chastain. You know, there's been a lot of efforts this week, a lot of letters to the editor in the Kansas City Star saying, why don't we make it more difficult, though, to actually get citizen petitions well, passed in, in the... Um, in the state, yeah. in, in the city of Kansas City, Missouri. Ha is there any effort by the city to do that? There was a couple of years ago. But there was a now? charter change that was actually voted down. Kansas Cityans are very protective of their rights to petition for specific ordinances and to hold referenda on ordinances they don't like. So that doesn't seem likely, but it's very easy. 5% of uh, mayoral voters, it's very easy to get these petition signatures. Okay. Well, speaking of transportation, are city leaders engaged in illegal electioneering on the upcoming streetcar vote? An ethics complaint has been filed against the mayor and the city council by one of the streetcar's main opponent groups, Citizens for Responsible Government, says the city is unlawfully spending $685,000 for an outreach program that will have canvassers knocking on doors in affected neighborhoods in July and October, just before two big votes on the streetcar line. The money is part of a multi-million dollar award to Burns and McDonald that was picked as the main streetcar engineers. So why would they need to go door to door if it's not to convince voters to support this, Barbara? Well, I think they're going to say it's for informational purposes, but, you know, I would think a colorful brochure would do the job <laughs> just as well. Um, I, you know, I don't know that this is necessarily illegal, but I can certainly see why the opponents are kind of in a state about it. 
Do, does they, do they actually need to go door to door? There doesn't appear to be any federal federal regulation that suggests that they have to. I mean, at the bare minimum, you need to. You know, there may be something about getting voters informed on this. But Barb, to your point, yeah, I mean, you could probably satisfy that with a mailing. Uh, this is politically dangerous for the mayor. No eth ethics complaint in the same way we've talked about Governor Brownback not wanting to see FBI next to his name. Anytime you're talking about ethics with a big project like that, especially when Burns and McDonald's involved, they were the they and their employees gave more money to Mayor Sly James' last campaign than any other group. This is sort of thin ice and, and it, it needs to be carefully navigated to not appear to be pushing or not appear to be giving contracts to favored groups to do something that they can't absolutely nail down has to be done. But just because you file a complaint though with the Missouri Ethics Commission doesn't mean that then stops that activity, does it? No, I mean the Missouri Ethics Commission's got a long history of not really being all that of a authoritative <laughs> organization. Well, you know, they're underserved, they're underfunded, they don't have a huge staff. When they do get involved in a situation, it's not always with the, you know, bringing the hammer down on elected officials. So. And the Kansas City Ethics Commission is even more toothless and irrelevant uh, in most cases. Uh, but I think Garrett has something uh, hit on an important point. It's the appearance of bad faith. And when you put this uh, situation next to the ballot language discussions, it does begin to taint the elected leadership of Kansas City politically in terms of how they address these problems in good faith or bad faith. And, and that's a political problem for all office holders. People are inclined to distrust the people they elect already. This just adds fuel to that fire and probably wasn't a wise thing. Barbara. Yeah, my, my one problem with the Kansas City Council of late is that they tend to be quite paternalistic. Yes. And, you know, they don't trust voters to figure out whether it's a bad light rail plan. They don't trust voters to figure out the streetcar thing. You and, know? and when they do something like this, they give voters a reason not to trust them. Right. And so the, the bad faith grows. And it begins to spread to other uh, uh, areas of government in the city, Nick. Uh, you know, you sort of hope that the mayor or someone at, at 12th and Oak says, in essence, we need to stop playing these games and adding to that bad faith feeling in Kansas City. Blaming Missouri lawmakers for a series of tax breaks they passed in the waning moments of the legislative session. Governor Nixon this week says he has no choice but to withhold more than three quarters like of a billion now, dollars from a slew of state agencies. But the hardest hit will be education. That means there'll be no funding increase for public school districts, colleges, or universities when the new school year begins. How much hardship does that cause? schools, Jason Hancock? I think a lot of them saw it coming. You okay. know, their budgets were f being finished up in the last month or so, and um, I, I think that they saw what the legislature had done. They'd seen the governor's reaction to that, and they kind of foresaw that we were going to go through this the same thing we did last year, which is the governor was going to hold back some money to try to use that as leverage to get the legislature to go along with his vetoes. Republican leaders, including though the House mm -hmm. Speaker himself, saying, oh, this is the governor, though, playing games. The first target that he picks is schools. If he's so concerned mm -hmm. about our young people, investing in our young people, he, the first acts he has this week is to, um, to veto the school transfer law and then to use education as the biggest right. pool of money uh, to withhold. Uh, couldn't he have picked other agencies uh, to, uh, to hit hardest here rather than schools? Well, that's a huge part of the budget. That's the okay. problem. Is K-12 education and higher ed are a huge part of the budget. And what he did, in, a, in essence, is he took away all the increases that the legislature put in almost across the board. And the biggest ones were 115 or so million dollars for K through 12, and then higher eds, I think 43 million dollars. Dental so. benefits for uh, Medicaid patients too. Right. That that went too. Well, yeah. and education is playing with fire a little bit. I mean, you, there's no issue that's going to animate people more than to say, "Wait, wait, excuse me, he cut funding for schools." I mean, it's definitely going to get people to pay attention. But whether they decide to blame the governor for withholding that money or these Republican legislators for putting him in this position, which is, of course, the argument he'll make, because uh, is a complete jump ball. But he's also talking about these these tax breaks going to wealthy interests in the state of Missouri. When you look at some of these tax breaks, as, as we did this week, some of those tax breaks include uh, adding graphing calculators to the list of items included in the back to school sales tax holiday, exempting products sold at farming uh, farmers markets, for instance, in the state of Missouri from the sales tax. Are these really sort of uh, benefiting wealthy folks against uh, regular Missouri families? Jason. Those in particular, probably not. The, he'll point to things like, uh, you know, dry cleaners or fast food restaurants getting breaks. And, and look, what the Republicans are going to say is that 
these are corrections, that the, the, the state started collecting sales taxes on some of these things that weren't collected before, so we're not going to lose any revenue by continuing to not collect these, these taxes, and that the governor is going back to a, his playbook, which is find the worst case scenario and just barnstorm around the state trying to scare people that the legislature is trying to bankrupt schools. So. Barbara. You know, you know, Nick, I just don't think you can look at what's going on in Jeff City without thinking that this giving things away is completely out of control. And, you know, they tried a few years ago, got a commission together to look at tax credits, look at giveaways. Nothing ever got resolved. But they, they just can't keep doing this because, you know, you have a, a budget that's full of holes. Yeah, on the other hand, Jay Nixon's feet are not, you know, are, are made a bit of clay on this. I mean, he called a special session to hand out millions in tax breaks to get Boeing to come to Missouri. He, he, he parades around the state. He was at Burns and McDonald this week cutting a ribbon or turning the earth for a new expansion out there that relies at least in part on, on some tax incentives. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it, he, his own political uh, posture may be complicated by his past statements on other issues. Like Is that. Missouri's constitutional amendment banning gay marriage about to crumble? This week, city officials in St. Louis issued marriage licenses to four same-sex couples just hours after federal judges struck down similar same-sex marriage bans in Utah and Indiana. St. Louis Mayor Francis Slay says the marriage licenses were issued with the intent of triggering a legal test of Missouri's gay marriage ban voters adopted a decade ago. But what's so special about these four couples? If you were a gay man or a gay woman anywhere in Missouri, can you now try and get a marriage license? I've thrown this to you at the last moment. I know that. Jason? Can you go get a yes. marriage license? Yes. No, well, you could try, I suppose. But the uniqueness of the St. Louis um, action was that they did these four marriages, and then they agreed to stop. And the, you know, there was an injunction that was attempted by the attorney general, and I believe it was a, the local judge that said, well, we, as long as we're not moving forward, the lawsuit that comes from these marriages can progress, but they won't continue to try to keep issuing marriage licenses. So it's right now it's four couples. And, this, and that's done exactly to open the door for a lawsuit. I mean, you look at what was going on in, I think it's the Eighth Circuit, which includes Kansas and Utah. There you have uh, an action in federal court that, you know, Kansas can sort of be siphoned into what's going on in Utah because they're in the same circuit. To challenge this in Missouri, you needed someone with legal standing in the state who is really, you know, this applies directly too and now you have those four couples and legally to get this done that's all you need this the significance of the uh, utah case at the 10th circuit which is kansas colorado utah you're good but I, not you're good. Asked, the eighth yeah. is missouri <laughs> yes. uh, the 10th circuit is the first appeals court that has said that bans on same-sex marriage are unconstitutional that question that broad question is working its way to the supreme court this is part of that strategy ultimately the justices in washington will decide this issue Okay. We head to Kansas now, and at a time when many Kansans may still be unfamiliar with Governor Sam Brownback's Democratic opponent, a new poll released this week shows some surprising numbers. The governor now trailing House Minority Leader Paul Davis by six percentage points. That's with a polling margin of error of plus or minus three percent. How much stock is being put on this latest poll from Survey USA? Garrett Hake? Well, on the one hand, it is one poll and it is June. But on the other hand, it opens up some very serious questions for Governor Brownback. And you have Paul Davis, who has almost no name recognition statewide, out polling the governor and closing in on the 50 percent number you would actually need. But the most interesting thing in this to me is that he is siphoning off Republicans. He holds on to 89 percent of Democratic voters. He doubles up on the governor and independent voters, and he attracts about a quarter of Republican voters. We've said on this program before that the danger for Governor Brownback was always that he was going to overreach and turn off some more moderate elements in Kansas Republican circles. And this shows that, at least to some small measure, that may be happening. But he is still a long shot, though, isn't he, Dave? Paul Davis? Yes. Uh, in isolation, this poll is not that important, but virtually every poll, there haven't been a lot, but virtually every poll shows Sam Brownback in serious trouble. We have to start taking that a little bit seriously. I mean, Paul Davis is leading or close to the lead in virtually every public poll. Okay. Um, and, and, and as Garrett points out, uh, the Sam Brownback's problems are, are intense in this area, in Johnson County, where there are a lot of moderate Republicans who think education is important. His, his popularity is very, very low. And it, uh, my guess is he sees the same numbers in his own private polling. And if they're not nervous, they need to be. Barbara. On the other hand, I 
do get the feeling that the Brownback campaign organization, which is formidable, is keeping its powder dry. We've not yet seen the full attack on the liberal lawyer from Lawrence that, that we're Obama, going to. Yeah, 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 I think we'll see that after well, the primary. All right. Saturday marks the 100th anniversary of the day Archduke Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was assassinated. It was the event that triggered the start of World War I. The World War I Museum here in Kansas City is taking a solemn approach to remembering the so-called war to end all wars. A lone bugler has performed taps at sunset on the deck of the Liberty Memorial every day this week. The evening taps will continue through Saturday. On that day, the museum is reenacting the assassination day starting at 11 a.m. A formal observance will be Saturday afternoon at 2 at the memorial with speakers and a performance by a Kansas City Symphony String Quartet. Efforts to make Liberty Memorial the nation's monument to World War I are still caught up in Congress, even though this is the centennial, despite passing the U.S. House. Why is getting that designation elusive and why does it matter, Dave Helley? Well, it matters because the people here want it and expect it because of their investment in the World War I Museum. It's taking forever because it's Congress. I mean, Congress is, you know, takes long. I mean, it'll be longer than actual World War I for them to decide this issue. Uh, we should point out that there is a commission established by Congress to commemorate World War I. Ike Skelton, who passed away this summer, was the chair of that group. They're working to try and, uh, and, try and uh, increase the awareness of uh, World War I here and across the country. And that is is our week in review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the Kansas City Star editorial board, writer Barbara Shelley, and Jefferson City reporter Jason Hancock, star political reporter Dave Helling, and 40 for 1 action news reporter Garrett Hake. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Good night.